Broadcasting. This is an interview for the University of Southern Mississippi Oral History Program. The interview is with Bill Bradford, and it is taking place on Tuesday, October 11, 2015, in Waveland, Mississippi, at the library. The interviewer is Stephanie Scaldi Army, and first I'd like to say thank you for being with us today and ask you for the record to state your name, please. My name is Bill Bradford. I am called William, uh, you know, by my uh, parents, but anyway, people around here know me as Billy. If they knew me before 1960, then I became Bill after my father died in 1960. And for the record, would you please spell it? B-I-L-L-B-R-A-D-F-O-R-D. Okay, thank you. And why don't you just tell me a little bit where you grew up and what that was like as we, that'll help us just settle into the interview. Okay, I was born in New Orleans in 1945. Uh, my parents bought uh, lots here in 1951, 52 era, and we came over here and we cleared, you know, for almost a year as far as clearing brush. I learned very early, you never throw brush to the next lot because we would always wind up purchasing the next lot. So anyway, you take things uh, in order and you do what you need to do. Okay. Well, then I guess we'll launch into these questions. How and why did you become a firefighter? I grew up, I was, my mother worked in New Orleans and I would be over here in Waveland anyway, uh, I lived on an oyster shell street. It was one of these things that I would go over to my neighbors. They had 12 children. Anyway, then I would come back after the noise decreased to my quiet house. So. Okay. And how did you get interested in fighting fires? It was one of these things that one of my neighbors had a fire get away from him. It was a brush fire. Anyway, I was very impressed the way that the firemen were able to come and extinguish it. I started, you know, attending and belonging to the fire department around 1962. But anyway, uh, just tell me now, wh what year did you graduate high school? I graduated in 63. So anyway, I was with the fire department. You know, my mother would not let me drive the car until I could afford insurance. Anyway, I was six foot four when I was 15. And, uh, you know, uh, at that time, the a uh, hose reel was all hand cranked. You did not push any buttons. There was no push button technique at that time. And so 1963 from high school, what about from your, getting your undergraduate degree? What year was that? 1967, I graduated from USM. And what did you do right after that? I went to medical school. And when did you finish there? 71. Okay, and then what did you do? I interned in Mobile, uh, Alabama, and then I was in the Navy. I was in the Navy from 1967 until 1967 until 1974. Uh, 74. 74. Right. Okay. You're seven years, one month, and one day. <laughs> But who's counting? Um, so then what did you do after you got out of the Navy? Did you go into private practice? I had taken a residency up in Louisville, Kentucky, and I went into emergency medicine. At that time, 
there were only three or four programs in the United States for emergency medicine. Uh, nowadays, they have over 160 programs for residency in emergency medicine. So I was at the very beginning of emergency medicine coming to fruition. So where's the first place you worked in ER as a civilian? Singing River Hospital in Pascagoula. Okay. Yeah, but that's a long way away from Bay St. Louis. How did you eventually get back to Bay St. Louis? Well, it, it was one of these things that <clears throat> at that time, the ER was staffed from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. It was through residency from ENT from Charity Hospital. So in other words, there was no opening here for me, but one of my classmates was over there at Singing River Hospital. So that's, you know, one of my classmates said, hey, we have a position open, you know, if you wish to come. Uh, so, but anyway, from 1976 until the year of 2000, I worked there at, you know, Singing River Hospital. I've worked every ER except Garden Park in Gulfport, you know, but in the six counties. So I've worked in Pearl River County, Hancock County, Harrison County, Stone County, George County, and Jackson County. So how did firefighting work into your medical career? Were you doing both at the same time? It was one of these things that I was a volunteer here. So anyway, whenever I would be home, I was not home during the time I was in medical school. I was, you know, was not home doing my internship. But anyway, uh, whenever I was home, we had the sirens that would ring off which ward the fire was in. Okay. So, um Tell me about the last fire you attended. The last fire I attended was a budget in on Highway 90. Uh, this was a motel, and it was one of these things that was at in winter time. Uh, and I think that it was probably in the late 90s that the last time that I was officially, you know, a volunteer fireman. Uh, you know, so that was the last fire that I attended, the motel out on Highway 90. Can you tell me about that fire, just kind of paint a picture for the listeners of what happened? It was cold and they had several different roofs. You know, with firefighting, you need to know the structure of a, of a uh, dwelling. So anyway, they had hidden roofs there, but it was one of these things that was so very cold, uh, so. What is the temperature, ambient temperature, like it being cold? Does that affect a fire or how you fight it? Yes, in other words, a lot of times, back in 1961, we had the temperature got down to eight degrees here in Bay St. Louis, and for one entire week, the temperature was less than 32 degrees. It affects just like heat, you know, temperature extremes affects the individuals being able to work a fire. Mm hmm. Because the firemen feel stress because. Well, of it. It, it, you're literally, you know, uh, back in 61, I was there by Washington Avenue. I went, it. It looked like I could ice skate, but anyway, the guys from Stance Loss, we had too many and the ice started breaking. And before I could take my pants off and swing them over, they were completely frozen. But I had underwear long johns on. 
Can you move around when your pants are frozen? Did you, was it because the water was getting on them? Yes. In other words, salt water freezes at 18 degrees. In other words, the temperature was less than 20 degrees. In other words, you know, you, you cannot, you know, uh, move, you know, so I needed to take them off. Wow. Is there anything else memorable about your last fire? Not really, not really. Okay. Well, how would you describe your finest hour in firefighting? My finest hour was in 1969, August the 17th, that I flew in. I was on active duty with the Navy. I was a Lieutenant JG. I tend to think that the people here, since I had worked for the water and gas growing up, I consider that the people consider that President Nixon had sent me here. But anyway, I was in full military garb, but uh, at the, I stayed at the Waveland uh, School. Uh, anyway, when water started coming in, you know, uh, we had to get everyone, it was around 120 people that we had on stage. You know, we did have a generator that had two or three 60 watt bulbs in it. Anyway, at the time of the eye, I went over to the other side of the track and brought back two skiffs in the event that we needed to evacuate people. I can remember when, you know, the people, they had their cars parked. And when I started seeing the cars float away, at that time, you could not take uh, pets. Anyway, I carried in maybe a dozen dogs who were in the vehicles because the people could not bring their pets. I'd much rather the people have their pets and keep them controlled, you know, than going out. The dogs would always crawl up to the top of my head because the water, when I started going out, was waist deep and that it got, you know, uh, chest deep. I remember using the citizen band radio saying that a fire had started on our business district, district and I wished if anyone could come to our assistance with 200 mile per hour winds, you know, no one came. This was during Hurricane Camille. Correct. And the, the Waveland School had been um, designated a shelter. It was designated as a shelter, except no Red Cross people were actually there. I did maintain a roster, you know, uh, so that if people were leaving, I could check them off that they had left at what time. So when you started out during the I, was there any surge? No. Now, in other words, you know, it was kind of like... Uh, we did have Motorola radios, and the firemen were there at the fire station, and we lost contact with them. Anyway, they went, they spread to the winds because of no one, you know, there was no real tidal surge. The water just started coming up and just kept coming up more and more. They used to have a a uh, culvert, or not a culvert, a ditch in front of the Waveland School, which was around five to six feet. And people would be coming to the school in with the water uh, being uh, above the street. They could not see where the ditch was, and they would be coming, and they would fall into it. But we never did lose anyone. But anyway, later that night, as people came in, talking about how their houses had imploded with the uh, storm. It was one of these things that we started 
finding out that we had fatalities here in Waveland. Hmm. Can you give me an example, just one example of a fatality? Max Giolone lived over on the Terrace Street, the street right over from Coleman Avenue. He and his wife were up on their chest to draw when the house imploded. Anyway, the last that he saw, his wife was being washed out. So he, he survived. But he did she survive. Didn't. Right. Did he come to your shelter? He did. With he did. that story. Right. Gosh. He did. Poor man. Um, Hurricane Camille. It was a night storm. Given a choice between a day storm versus a night storm, we'd much rather take a day storm. What happened the day after Camille in terms of working with firemen or working with the shelter? What was that day like for you? It was one of these things that, you know, I was up all night because of working a fire. Uh, the fire engines had actually gone underwater and we were able to get them started, their engines, and we moved them out of the fire station and we put a hard suction hose. The water was around four or five feet deep. But anyway, uh, Bill Rito, who used to have operate the Dairy Queen right there, uh, he is deceased now, but anyway, he took charge of the engine and I took the hose and we were able to uh, save Mrs. Louise Lynch's Waveland Pharmacy uh, store. She was able to live there for 36 years after. You pumped the water out right. of it? Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, she lived on the second floor. The first floor was the pharmacy. But anyway, we were using uh, quilts until we were able to get the hose and we were spraying uh, water up on their roof. Was it on fire? It was. It was on fire. Wow. So you were... You were this you... was around 2 a.m. in the morning. So in other words, from 2 a.m. until 9.30, we were fighting fires here in Waveland uh, on that business district. So were you using surge water? Right. Mm -hmm. what, what was happening with the hydrants? Could you not use the hydrants? Were they gone? It's one of these things that, you know, at the time that we were pumping water, you know, you could not even find where a hydrant was because of the water. You know, the water was, you know, from here to here. So in other words, we were able to get, you know, the uh, uh, truck's engines operating and we were able to get the pump. So anyway, we were just pumping from the street onto the uh, building that was on fire. Okay. Whether or not it was purposely set, I would hate to think that people would stoop that low. But anyway, there was a lot of uh, natural gas, you know, everything. Back in 1965 with Betsy, almost every building on the Beach Boulevard had a pier. But anyway, in 65, you know, uh, those piers, when they broke down with the wave action, they became ramrods. Back, you know, after Betsy, we had our beach pumped in. So anyway, you know, before 1965, you just would go to the seawall and that there was water right there. I used to always enjoy shrimping there, catching crabs there. Uh, so. For the record, for people who might not live next to a coast, can you just explain what a seawall, what did the seawall look like before the sand beach? It was around three steps down Anyway, it was built back in 1926 era, but anyway, uh, uh, what was the material? Concrete, concrete, and there's no 
the remaining part of what used to be, it's all gone. So they dredged sand up from underwater mm -hmm. and piled it up next to the shoreline and made a right. sand beach. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was after Betsy. After Betsy. We did have it during, you know, uh, we did have it uh, for, for Camille. So in other words, there was a beach out in front. Waveland used to always be, you know, it was a resort town. Anyway, like Ronnie Farrell had said, people would come in from Easter Sunday and they usually would depart on Labor Day. Anyway, it was so quiet from Labor Day until the next Easter, uh, very quiet uh, and peaceful here. Were there a lot of people who shrimped and fished for a living? Yes, yes. Okay, so you had the fishing industry and the tourist industry that yes. kind of made mm -hmm. the town. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else about Betsy or Camille that you wanted to talk about or put on the record? I don't think so. Well, tell me about Hurricane Katrina, your experience of Hurricane Katrina. I was 36 years older when Katrina hit. You know, I was in my 20s, uh, probably around 24, 25, uh, when, Bet when uh, uh, Camille hit. Uh, I felt as though I could do everything at that time. You know, uh, I had my family and we stayed at our house, which was on the north side of the railroad track, uh, on the poor side of the railroad track. But it was one of these things that, uh, you know, up until around 8.33 on Monday morning, we considered it was just a normal, everyday storm. Then my wife told me that there's water in our driveway. And I said, let's get uh, some blanket or a quilt to soak up any water to keep it from coming in the house. Before she could present with a blanket or a quilt, the water outside of the house was five feet. We were worried that a tree was coming to our van. Later, uh, you could not even see the van. My wife had pictures which are on Wikipedia, Waveland, anyway, from our second floor window of people floating by. Anyway, why were they floating by? The one individual who lived on Lafitte Drive, he had two Dutch hound or weenie dogs, and he had three cockadoos. In other words, his mother was up at the Waveland Resort Inn and because they would not allow people to come with their animals, that was why he was there. But anyway, his entire house was destroyed and he was floating on a roof that went over. I lost five miniature horses, you know, uh, during the time of, you know, uh, Katrina. I had a hundred bales of hay, I had five sacks of feed, Anderson Cooper came and they filmed myself and my children dragging the carcasses out. Anyway, they showed that on Thursday night. On Friday, after the storm, we had people came over from Alabama, said that, you know, we brought you some feed and some hay, and if you wish, we'll be here tomorrow morning at daybreak to take your horses since we had no running water, no uh, fences, but it was one of these things that they kept them for four months. You know, uh, very, very nice people that I had never even met. Wow, that's great. So the horses were in the barn? Yes, they were in the barn. Could not get out. They could not get out until the water got so high. It was 10 feet in the barn, uh, but anyway, the doors literally burst out off the hinges. 
Right, but who expected it to? No, we did not expect it. No, I'm sure you would have done things differently. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was a tough spot for people who had animals. Um, Some people, I'm sure, died because they would not. I'm glad that in 2005, by the time that they came to Hurricane Rita, that they had rethought you know, that they would either have people come with their dogs or cats in a cage and that the people would take care of the animals while the people were in the shelters. So anyway, there was a thawing or re, uh, rethought about not letting people have their pets. So you didn't really take your pet into the shelter where other people were, but right. it could Another stay... W- in, in a, another section where volunteers were taking care of the correct. animals mm-hmm. and that big, big crates, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah, and I think people went and visited their pets. Yes, they, they could, right. they could. Yeah, that's, that makes a lot more sense. Is there anything else about Hurricane Katrina that you wanted to share? We're coming up to the 10th year anniversary on the 29th of this month. I'd say that, you know, we're a long way away. To me, Waveland, it reminds me of the 1950 era. Actually, at the time of the storm, I consider there were only around 15 families, you know, from a population of 8,000. Only 15 families were still in the area, at, you know, who survived the storm. Has that changed? Our population is, you know, down from, you know, before 2005. I think that we're around 6,000 people now in Waveland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, You mentioned Hurricane Rita. I've heard some people call Hurricane Rita the forgotten hurricane. It was, it was about a month after Katrina, and it was pretty bad. Yeah. My nephew lived in Chalmette. He worked at Harrah's Casino as an electrician. Anyway, uh, Rita was a rewash. His house went back underwater. And anyway, he said that there was no hope in Chalmette He considered that there was hope here in Waveland. So anyway, he moved here. He commutes each day to the casino to work as an electrician. Wow. So a lot of people who had been flooded by Katrina's storm surge got submerged again by Rita's storm surge. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about firefighting some. Can you des- describe some of the traditions that firefighters have? It was one of these things that, you know, with Kenny Fayard, he was the fire chief. He died at such an early age. You know, uh, we placed our, a black thing over our badges and his uh, casket was carried on the fire engine. They did have a final call, you know, it was it was very intriguing that I had never been to a fireman's funeral before, but it was an eye-opener for me. Well, can you tell me about it? It was one of these things that uh, getting a casket up high. (laughs) Kenny was not a real heavy individual, but anyway, getting a casket up high on the fire truck, that was the thing that I always remember uh, about uh, that. uh, Did did y'all do that manually? Yes, yes. How many people did it take? Six. Wow. Yeah. Can you think of any other traditions that firefighters have? Well, 
It was one of these things that when I got married, uh, they came and picked me up from the church, took me and my bride, you know, uh, on Beach Boulevard, down Coleman Avenue, Central Avenue, and then uh, Vacation Lane. So anyway, that was before I could go to my reception. Uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. But that was very nice of him to do that. I can remember going to Fire Academy. I went to probably a Fire Academy around three or four times. Anyway, one of the courses I took was Advanced Rescue Techniques. I had to repel off of a five-story building. Anyway, uh, Lee Farrell, he was a fire marshal here, Lee looked at me and said, Bill, we don't have anything, it's even four stories in Waveland. But anyway, we were able to, you know, uh, survive. In other words, he once again, with rescue techniques, it was one of these things that you would always, they would take a mask and put duct tape on it so you could not see. And then you would go into an area and you'd have to use the dorsum or the back part of your hand because if in case there was electrical uh, wiring you want it to be you know the back of your hand that you were feeling it not the front otherwise you would grasp it and you'd be electrocuted I think I remember learning that maybe in a first aid class possibly especially mm -hmm. like they I think that if you're the fires on the other side of the door, say, and you might want to test it right. for how hot it is, mm -hmm. you don't put your hand on the handle in case electricity were there and you'd get that reflex action right. of just, your muscles contract, I mm -hmm. guess. It and, is. And then you're stuck there. Well, what was the purpose of a mask with duct tape? In other words, you have to go as far as, it was a search and rescue. So anyway, they would have a body as far as a mannequin that you'd have to find and come out, you know. And here, once again, we've talked about, you know, when they would come down with a Christmas tree. Anyway, uh, this was something that the first time you did it, you thank God that you were still alive. I mean, uh, the heat and the... Uh, sound of the gas was something else. LPG fires, liquid petrified uh, petroleum products, very dangerous, you know, when they come by on the railroad tracks in the 18 wheelers or just coming uh, with gasoline and petrol products. So, did they want your eyes covered because in a fire you might right. not In other able... words, you know, usually when you enter a smoke-filled area, you know, you get close to the ground. But anyway, uh, you, you would not be able to see. Why would you get close to the ground? Usually the oxygen, in other words, smoke goes up. In any way, the oxygen, you know, would be closer to the ground. Okay, so maybe you'd be able to breathe. Yes, yeah. but anyway, we would have self-contained breathing apparatus, you know, on us. Scuba. Right. Mm -hmm. Except not underwater. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Some Just of the elements I can remember with the fire station... One of our aldermen, Johnny Longo, he was a current mayor or, you know, later became mayor. Twice that he pulled down the garage door of the uh, fire station and was going to a fire with the garage door right behind him. With George Ferry and them, this was on a Labor Day fire, that the hose started coming out and they had over 300 foot of hose when he would try to make a curve. He had 300 foot of hose behind him. But anyway, Kenny Fayard, uh, 
Kenny uh, was went to a fire, but he was in the kitchen beforehand, and when he got back, the fire had started in the kitchen of the fire station. Was it his fault? Well, he, he should have taken the things that was <laughs> off of the burner. <laughs> was it a bad fire in the kitchen? Ah, probably several thousand dollars. Had everybody left? Yeah. To go to the fire. One, one thing is that with the fairies, they had 12 children. And I can remember when uh, the phone call came in that their house was on fire. Mm. We left two trucks on Coleman Avenue that were having problems. Anyway, they we were able to get them started, but they conked out and all of the firemen got onto one truck, we, uh, the third truck and we went to their house. Thank goodness it was a kitchen fire and we were able to uh, extinguish it. Um, are there any other mem memorable fires in your, mem in your memory? Like, um, were you at the munition plant? I was not at the munition plant. I was an intern at, you know, this happened in 1972. So I was, my sister gave me a call saying that half of Hancock County had been blown off the map. I never was even aware that a munitions plant existed up there off of 603. But anyway, the one thing that I can remember, we had just gotten a 1947 American La France truck from Keesla. It had only around 14,000 miles on it. I mean, fire trucks, except for driving it around, they don't get very much mileage. But anyway, the gold medal bakery fire there in Bay St. Louis, we were there around six to eight hours uh, back in 1965. Uh, I was not here when we lost six children that David Gosh uh, spoke about. I was at a heart association meeting up at the Peabody Hotel in Memphis at that time. That happened around Easter time. Uh, the gold medal of fire in 65, when did it occur in relation to Betsy? It was before. Before, okay. And you, so, were, you were there? Right. I Do you want to tell us about that fire? The American La France, it had an open cab. I can always remember uh, driving it anyway, uh, especially for thunderstorms. Because in other words, being an open cab, you would get rain or hail or anything else that would come. Uh, but it was one of these things that, uh, you know, we had at least three different fire departments there, you know. The people that worked there, the people who would deliver bread, when they left, the gold medal bakery was intact. When they came back, it was just ashes. So I saw grown men crying because their livelihood was gone. So. Any idea what started that fire? I'm not sure. I'm yeah. not really sure. How it, long? It was a during the day, daytime. How long did it take it to burn down? One thing is that with fires, you always stay even after the last embers have been extinguished just to make sure you know you you never wish to have a re re uh, tread of a fire uh, getting started again so anyway uh, probably we were able to knock it down in less than three hours but it's still the whole thing was gone right the whole thing was gone gone do you remember the Q Street oil fire? I was not there, but anyway, Dickie Ferry, he was there, and later on that night, his home burnt. So anyway, he once again, finding out, you know, kind of like with Ronnie Farrell, finding that they were searching for him at the munitions plant. They did not know if he was alive or dead. You know, uh, it 
places, things, life is very delicate and very precious to us. And it would get, I'm, I'm sure that it would seem more so for people who see that lives oh. are lost. Well, one thing is that I learned in medical school, I could not cure everyone, but I could hold their hand as they're making their final exit to see their creator. So. Yeah, that's a very special moment. Oh, yes, yes. Do you think that um, most people want to have company at that time? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. So. Yeah. I can remember when we went from, we became a city in, after the 1970 census. You need to be a city, I think you need to have 3,000 inhabitants. Anyway, uh, when we went from RFD, Rural Free Delivery, to having a home address, I found out how hazardous it is being a, a postman. When we would go up, and a lot of times the dogs would come you know, it is a hazard, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with that neighborhood. Did the firemen go from door to door and yes. try to assign numbers? Yes. Uh -huh. Wow. Yes. Golly, how did you decide? What well, in other words, Walter Turcott, who I wish that he would be here. Well, maybe we can get him another time. So, but anyway, uh, he was a postmaster. And uh, it was one of these things that, here once again, I grew up at 409, you know, Furry Street. My sister was 426. She was on the same side. So anyway, it took us almost 40 or 50 years to figure that why should odd and even numbers be on the same side of the street? So it's kind of like when my mother was went to a nursing home. It took my sister and I six months to decide that She's never coming back. We need to DC her uh, television service. We need to DC her telephone. Uh, so decommission. Oh yes. What about boat fires at the port or harbor? Do you remember those? I don't really remember. I, I did not attend that. In other words, you know, I can remember Debbie Lucas. Her father was, uh, you know, uh, Bob Lucas. Uh, he was very instrumental. Bob Lucas and Joe Griffin, they were two individuals that I learned of uh, very much about firefighting. But anyway, we would always repair the Waveland Municipal Pier. This was volunteer that we would, you know, make sure that all the, uh, planks were down, and if there was anything that needed to be refitted, we would refit things. What kinds of things happened at Waveland Municipal Pier? I used to, when I was, you know, I used to always be catching sand sharks out at the very end of the pier, and people would still be swimming. Uh, so anyway, uh, I mean, the sand sharks were only around three or four feet. Uh, they were not that large. But it was one of these things that, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of like the, I always enjoy wetting a line, getting your uh, fishing line, you know, uh, and uh, it's kind of like going to the barber shop. The barber shop, you know, Chris Ladner cut hair. He rented uh, from the city underneath the city hall for $10 a, a month. At, he started in 1947, June of 1947, but he was cutting my hair, uh, you know. Uh, it was one of these things that when a woman would walk into the barber shop, everything would go quiet. I don't know exactly how much was truth or how much was fiction, you know, with the things that I heard in the barber shop, you know, uh, but it was certainly interesting in listening to everyone's, 
it was kind of like a coffee shop before coffee shop became popular. But not fit for women's ears. Well, well one thing is that the people uh, would clam up. We did have Police Gazette. That was a playboy of the 1950 era. The Police Gazette with the pinups. <laughs> Did they hide those when women would come into the barber shop, or maybe somebody stood in front of it? Oh gosh! <laughs> in Waveland, we did have a newspaper. It existed from 1959 until 1961. It was called the Waveland Advocate. But it was one of these things that, you know, usually the writings would be so and so had a visitor from someplace else that it was just keeping up with things that were going on. But that was defunct before Betsy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess it's past Christian, a woman who was not a native of the coast. Her name is Evelina Schmuckler. Has a Do you know news? her? No. She started. Um, a newspaper? Yeah, what was it? The Gazette, something Gazette, or Gazette. Mm, I can't remember, it's two words and I can't remember what came before Gazette. Mm -hmm. And it was a really helpful organ to have after Katrina. Oh, yes. Yeah, I think it's still, still, still going over there. Still operation. One thing is that I had just learned about there's a fourth ward cleaver. This is on the internet from, you know, Waveland and Bay St. Louis submit their things. You know, we have our alderman writes up you know, uh, article each month for the fourth ward cleaver. Uh, but anyway, the internet has really replaced, I'd say that newspapers are on the decline or we probably won't see them in the next 10 years. Until you have a Katrina and there are no computers. Yeah. yeah. So it's redundancy is good. It's oh yes. Always. So was the Waveland Municipal Pier mostly for people to fish or did boats tie up there? No, no boats. In other words, they had, you know, people swimming there. And uh, at the very end of it, uh, our, our current pier, it's over 900 feet. It was called the Garfield Ladner Pier. Garfield Ladner, he was a mayor. He was elected in 1942 by one vote, and he died in office in 1973. But anyway, uh, Garfield, he uh, let me work. You know, when we were in college, you would sometimes have, you know, three or four weeks off for East or for Christmas. He would let us work for the city during that time. It was very, very helpful. In other words, my father died in 1960. Literally, I was raised by the town. You know, between the town and the Ferry family, you know, uh, they literally raised me. Uh, so, Was your mother working? Yes, in New Orleans. Um, I had a question. Uh... What kinds of things did you do for the city when you worked on break? One thing is that usually I work for the water and gas. That would be, you know, helping individuals. You know, there were subdivisions and then we would be putting down gas lines. Uh, back in 1965, I was working for the water and gas in the ditch which uh, broke, in other words, the thing that you would dig ditches with. Then I started working up at the hospital. I was a volunteer until they told me that we needed an orderly. So anyway, in 1965, you know, I was able to work at the Hancock County uh, uh, Hospital on Dunmore Avenue. As an orderly? Yes. What mm -hmm. does an orderly do? Usually I would be baking up beds and I would, you know, see if the people needed. They would deliver food to the individuals. 
In any way, I lost two individuals. Charles Ferry, he was the individual who had the 12 children. That was Alfred's father. He died in 1965. And uh, Mr. Chapman, he operated a paper business there in Bay St. Louis. But anyway, uh, I went to school with his son. But it was one of these things of just trying to be helpful, getting a warm blanket for a member of his family that might be sitting there. This was in the days that you had oxygen tents. You know, you could not even literally see an individual because of the oxygen and with the condensation. Instead of masks. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oxygen tents. Well, how did you learn to put down gas lines when you were working for the city? This was during the summertime. And how did you learn how to do that? Literally, you know, I was six foot four, weighed around 175 pounds, and when they needed brunt, I was the brunt. You know, uh, I can remember lots of water hydrants being put down anyway. The water and hydrants back in the old days, it was kind of like dancing with a fat woman. Anyway, uh, very difficult, you know, to do. But anyway, you know, literally it would take three or four individuals for how uh, uh, cast iron, how heavy they were. You guys were picking those things up manually. Oh, yes, yes. yes. Wow. Okay. Um, what about social events for firefighters? Picnics, suppers, do you have any memorable ones? For myself, since I was single, I very seldom attended them. But any time that they would have a supper, you know, usually a fire would occur. So in other words, guys who wore their Sunday suit on would be gone to fight a fire. Usually it was always a brush fire that, usually it was a brush fire that was threatening the home, so. Okay. Tell me about fire academies and schools in your experience. Well, I went to around three or four different fire academies. Uh, it was very interesting to me. Uh, anyway, uh, the fire academy, I'd say that it was excellent as far as the training. It was a shame that I spent one week taking a driver safety course, and then when they came home, we used to have at our shopping center a uh, driver's course with combs. I literally hit three different combs, you know, so anyway, I think that they did not wish me to drive the fire truck. Uh, I learned a lot about uh, rear view mirrors, you know, with a fire truck for how large that they are, you need to have a rear view mirror. Is there anything else about academies or schools that you wanted to mention? We used to always put on extrication exercises here. This was how to remove a human being from a wrecked vehicle. But anyway, things have certainly changed you know, uh, nowadays they have airbags on the doors. I mean, back in those days, they did not even have seat belts back in the, you know, early 60s, early 70s. Real steel automobiles. Oh, yes. I tell you what, when I was over in the Philippines, those real steel automobiles, it's just like in Cuba. They're still working. They don't need to buy a car every year. Those um, metal steering wheel columns cause oh, yes. lots of blunt chest injuries. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Let me just stop and ask you guys if you have to be back in Hattiesburg at a certain time. We're, we're down to the last couple of questions. I don't think it'll take us much longer, okay? Um, With the storms, 2013 was Isaac. Okay. Isaac was the equivalent of the st September 19th storm in 47. Anyway, from talking with Louise Lynch, who's going to be 93 in December, anyway, uh, the water came up as high with Isaac as it did in the 1947. This was my birthday. My mother went out saying that the power's out, the ice cream's melting, y'all come. So That was the hurricane of 1947? Right. How so, old were you? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Do you remember very much about it? Only the pictures I have of the trees being broken, you know. Uh, but anyway, all those pictures, they've floated off. In other words, it's so nice to have us this is for posterity as far as the future generations to know how things used to be. In 47, they weren't naming hurricanes. No, they were not. So it's known as the hurricane of 1947. But right. so September, in, September 19th. In 2013, you got to experience it. Yes. So. What do you remember about Isaac? Well, one thing is that when you all came down from, you know, uh, 603, when you pass over the I-10, from I-10 all the way to Nicholson was all water. So anyway, uh, here once again, it irks me that, I think that they paid something like $30,000 $30, to have uh, the concrete on both sides of where the water went. And the real estate agents had them erase where the high water went. You can still see the, you know, uh, concrete area when you go, if you go up 603 on I-10. But, you know, for over $30,000, it was just wasted because the people did not wish us to, it was bad for real estate. Wow, I don't see how they got away with that. Well, politics. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like me being in the medical field. I had to frequently come up against people, you know, uh, when the mayor of Bay St. Louis said that they could sell spice at the tobacco shops, I said, no way when they want to use paraquat for uh, pine trees. Paraquat is one of these things that if you put oxygen on the individual, it makes them worse. So anyway, that's the only condition that I know of that when oxygen is applied, it makes conditions worse. Oxygen usually heals? Usually, but in other words, too high of oxygen. But one thing is that I went to the Seacoast Echo and I presented them over two inches of uh, uh, medical cases of how dangerous paraquat was. It's a herbicide. It's a herbicide. It's kind of like Agent Orange. You and I were talking about, you know, I was exposed more to Agent Orange over at the CB base than I was in Vietnam. Right. Tell me about the new station and how it was built. This was the Gulf side, you know, uh, we, you know, in 1969, we had only one station which was on the south side of the railroad track. We need to have some way if the uh, fire was north of the railroad track of being able to respond quickly, especially if there's a daggum freight train. I mean, you know, the, the fire would extinguish, uh, you know, it waiting for a daggum freight train. Uh, but anyway, uh, all of the work was done. I remember one day 
we worked around eight hours putting up uh, uh, two by fours inside and later we were told that we did it wrong. So in other words, eight hours of work had to be redone. Uh, so. But it was one of these things that I always enjoyed working with the fire department. You know, it was it like we were saying, family. They were actually family. What comes to your mind when I say fireworks? I would always, we would sometimes respond to maybe 12 to 18 fires on the 4th of July. You know, uh, anyway, here once again, if you ever did see the UMC commercial about University Medical Center where the children have that balloon that goes up, they did that at the Relay for Life. It went up, it caught fire in the tree. So anyway, he once again, I wonder how many uh, injuries have been caused by their commercial. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't asked you today that you'd like to put on the record? Not really. As far as I was enjoyed seeing, you know, the Ronnie Farrell and, you know, get David Garsh's, you know, rendition because, I mean, every one, it's kind of like an elephant. If you look at the back, you get a different idea of what the trunk is. But anyway, when uh, storms came, you were only uh, knew what was going on where you could see. So in other words, you did not know what was going on a half a mile away because quite frequently, after Katrina, the railroad track seemed to be uh, a gateway that we could walk on, as opposed to the roads having so many houses destroyed with the debris there. In 1969, having been with the Seabees, the Seabees' motto is can do. In in 1969 with Katrina, with the devastation from the south side of the railroad tracks, the CB had the equipment and they knew how to use it. So in other words, I have nothing but praise uh, for the CBs. Did they do a lot of clearing? Yes. After Hurricane Camille? Right, they did. Anything else, Dr. Bradford? Nothing else. Well, I want to say thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming down here. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll be getting in contact with you all because supposedly no one in Hancock County has that capability of doing oral histories. So anyway, we would like, you know, for the future generations to know uh, how it was like growing up. Okay.